live from SABC headquarters in Auckland Park, Johannesburg. Welcome to this last edition of The Watchdog. My name is Vuyo Mvoko and on the show this evening... The ANC finds it regrettable that a letter from former President Takumbeki directed that national officials have landed in the public domain. The ANC expels eight councillors for voting with the opposition to elect a DA speaker in the Mangawong Metro Council. This at the end of a week in which the governing party's national leadership had to deal with the aftermath of a leaked letter written by its former president, Thabo Mbeki, who was scathing about the behavior of ANC parliamentarians over President Cyril Ramaphosa's Palapala saga. Our panel reflects on the week that was for the ANC. The current leader and leadership will be re-elected. The official opposition's former leader is tipping incumbent John Stenhazen as the ultimate winner of the party's elective congress that's taking place this weekend. Tony Leon, however, admits in our interview that ousting the ANC in the 2024 national election is not as easy as the biggest opposition party's leaders make it out to be. All that and more in tonight's episode of The Watchdog, which starts right now. Battle lines are drawn between the ANC's warring factions in the Free State. This week, the ANC's Lawrence Matai lost to the DA's Marike Davis, who was elected Maung Metro Council Speaker. The ANC today announced that it had expelled eight of its councillors who had voted with the DA. Mangawung Deputy Mayor Mapaseka Mutibi Nkwani and former Speaker Stephanie Lokman Naidu are among the eight members of the ANC who have been expelled from the party. Proportional Representation Councillor Patrick Munyakwani is another. The party announced that it was also discussing the future of three more councillors. This week, the ANC's Lawrence Matai lost to the DA's Marike Davis, who was elected council speaker. The party is now considering legal action to challenge the legitimacy of the council seating. We have, we have called you to communicate our decision to expel eight councillors. Uh, it's four PR councillors and four ward councillors. These are councillors uh, that have continuously been voting with opposition. Uh, there may be more, however, these eight councillors are the ones that for in the past we, we provided them with a fair opportunity to can present their case. The ANC says it is its prerogative to approach the courts to reverse the outcomes of the council sitting even after it participated in the proceeding. It says that the council sitting was not procedurally constituted. It adds that the acting municipal manager Debu Khomotla Shuping constituted the sitting despite his time in office having lapsed. We strongly believe that the council that took place uh, on Wednesday did not was not convened uh, by a person who has the authority to do so. You would know that uh, the acting city manager then his term of deployment or assignment to the municipality had come to an end. A council which said about two weeks ago concluded not to extend his term of office. Rather, a different name was suggested by a council. The ANC says it is confident that it will retain the mayorship of the city as it had four other smaller parties that are cooperating with it. Kamakhelo Siegui, SABC News, Bloemfontein. to help us make sense of uh, this development, as well as others we've witnessed this week. Please welcome our panelists for this evening, political analysts, Dr. Levi Ndo and Sandy Le Swana. Good evening to both of you, and thank you so much for your time. Good evening to your viewers and to your viewers. Well, I guess I mean, <laughs> the one question um, that uh, people have been asking um, since uh, the announcement um, that was made by the ANC that this was going to expel um, these eight councillors from the party is what is 
going on, Mr. Swana? Hey, uh, Manga uh, maybe even as a proxy of the Free State, has been a troubled province for some time and a troubled city metro for some time. Clearly, uh, the long uh, period of misrule and misgovernance there has created factions. And clearly, the renewal that Gwede Mandash and others have been leading in that province uh, has not yet taken root. So those who are disgruntled are now uh, openly expressing their dissatisfaction by voting with the opposition and are not being convinced by the favored faction, perhaps, that they are fo their fortunes will, be uh, will prosper with the, with the new faction that uh, uh, Dukwana and Kampana are bringing on board. So instability clearly is going to continue in Mangaung because of ANC faction that are rooted in the long-term corruption and mismanagement that has plagued Mangaung for a very, very long time. What do you make of it, Dr. Ndo? Please unmute. Apologies, um, Vuyo and the viewers. For me, it's exactly what um, my colleague Swana is saying. Factionalism appears to be the root cause of the events that are unfolding in Mangao. But this is not only the case of Mangao. We have had a situation where in Lipalale, councillors in that council voted against the ANC and that brought a candidate from another political party. And the divisions that are there in the ANC which the ANC is clearly unable to manage, has to bring what we actually see in Mangao. One of the metros that appears not to be performing as expected is Mangao, not only because of incapacities and lack of financial resources, but because politicians and in the main those that are coming from the ruling party are bogged down and they're quite busy with um, uh, fighting for positions, ensuring that uh, uh, faction A or that other faction makes it onto the council and defying the leadership. But also another factor that has, has come out in the AAC politics is jealousy amongst members of the same party. When Comrade A is uh, given this opportunity to lead, some within the party would not want to see that person emerge and they would rather vote for the opposition. But I see the ANC starting to weep, especially on those that appear not to be towing the party line. It's either you are for the party or you are actually out. And that is what one expects from the party because every political party is supposed to have rules and regulations that are supposed to be followed. Otherwise, if you do as you like in a political party, then it's better off without a political party because without rules and regulations, you cannot have a political party. To the ANC, uh, Mr. Swana, I mean, it's, it's, it's blasphemous to... Uh, vote uh, with the DA, let alone help install a DA candidate. Clearly, uh, this group of councillors uh, is spoiling for a fight. Let me maybe preface my answer with two things. The first one is that if you listen to them now speaking, the ANC leaders there, they are confident of winning the mayorship uh, the, the, the speakership back on the basis of support by minority parties. Mm. So it appears to me that in any event, they no longer have their own inherent strength to take control of the municipality. Mm. Uh, previously, in, in terms of the last elections, we thought that Buffalo City and, of course, Mangaung are the ones that have been saved, let alone because uh, clearly Deben, uh, that is a Tegwini, had to be saved by 
another small party for, to, to be in the camp of the ANC. Mm. But we would have thought this one was secure, but clearly tonight we know it is not. Um, secondly, when you listen to Mbalula, their Secretary General, talking now, lately, he is listing a number of very many different parties that the ANC has been in coalition with and that they work with every other party. So whilst uh, we could be saying that, yeah, it's a, it's a blasphemous for ANC um, uh, representative to vote with the DA, uh, but you may eventually find that the party itself, which is the ANC itself, uh, in the near future might not be even adverse in forming, forming some coalitions with the same DA that they are chasing people away from. But what this chasing away represents, actually, it represents the doctrine that party bosses must be, must be obeyed at all times. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily any other thing more than that. The, the, the line that the party pro bosses point to, you must tell that line. That, that is what I can attribute to. Any other thing about the relationship between the ANC and the DA, uh, don't take it too far because you next year you could find that in some provinces the ANC might just study, start getting in bed with the DA. You don't know. Now, Fikile Mbalula has been uh, talking tough as uh, Mr. Swana is saying, um, Dr. Ndo, a, a summary expulsion of uh, these uh, uh, councillors is perhaps a clear sign um, and a warning, you know, a, a message is being sent to all and sundry that none of this is going to be tolerated going forward, isn't it? Indeed, you, you don't expect the ANC to be worried about its own deployees. You don't, have, you don't have to expect the ANC to, to put an emphasis on their deployees on how they're supposed to vote. And in a situation where you have members of the party voting against the party wishes, it's a clear indication that something is quite wrong within the party. When you hear the party talking about having to rely on other smaller parties whilst they've got a majority in the council, it should be a worrying factor. And of course, in that situation, you need strong leadership, which has been expressed by uh, the Secretary General Baluna. And action appears to have started to happen. My expectation is that the ANC leadership should be in charge of their own deployees and any action that is related to what has happened in Mangaung has to be uh, enforced so that members of the party should know that there are consequences for not touring the party line. I've indicated that it has happened in other municipalities like in Lipalale, I expect the ANC leadership to be in charge so that those who join political parties should be reminded that when you join a party, you abide by the rules and regulations of that party. Of course, the Mangawong headache is coming on top of another one. Um, uh, I mean, this week, um, the... Uh, letter was leaked, written by uh, the ANC's former president, Thabo um, to um, uh, uh, Paul Mashadile, the deputy president of uh, the ANC, critical of the behavior of ANC MPs um, on, on the, around the whole Palapala um, saga, uh, Mr. Swana. Yes. I I think the Palapala saga, uh, I will come to the letter itself. The Palapala saga is divisive within the ANC. Um, and it's not necessarily divisive among the opposition parties and society because uh, a very large number of opposition parties have stood firmly against a, 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 a Palapala issue and wanted an impeachment process and then an ad hoc committee process to be started. However, in co consistent with our discussion tonight, we must remember that 
Because I was voted against the instructions of the party bosses, and she has not been expelled, and she has not changed her mind to vote uh, uh, consistent with the party line on the Palapala question. She's stand, standing against it. In that standing against the money laundering and other active criminal activities that took place in Palapala, she is joined by the likes of Mavusom Siman, who stated clearly on Radio 702 that uh, Sir Ramaphosa should have long st stepped aside from his position as president so that investigations can continue unhindered by his pres presence. Uh, Tabombeki has then written a 17-page letter uh, where he explains in detail why the ANC has made counter-revolutionary decisions by actually stopping the investigation of Palapala without knowing the actual true facts of what happened at Palapala, whether impeachable uh, activities took place there, whether corruption took place there, whether money laundering and so on took place. In taking the decision to prevent the investigation of Palapala, they have then divorced the masses that Lutuli, uh, Tambo, and Mandela were fighting for. So the ANC is now a 40% party, having moved from 70% to 40% through the continuous insistence that corrupt activities such as Ganja and Palapala must be defended and protected by the ANC members of parliament, regardless of what the Constitutional Court says, regardless of what the Constitution itself says. So indeed, uh, the letter is leaked and that is irrelevant. The fact that it has been leaked is irrelevant. The fact that what matters, what you need to discuss is the detailed content of the 17 pages. And I want to believe the ANC has no answer, no credible answer to that letter, to that 17 page letter. Well, given where you started, Mr. Swano, I, I then can't resist uh, asking you this uh, a question. What then <laughs> is the difference? In other words, those eight councillors who have been summarily ex, uh, uh, I mean, expelled, what do they make of the fact that um, this, what has just happened to them, didn't happen to a Nkosazan Adlamin Zuma? You know, I have said before, and it might be an unfair example, but it will illustrate the point. I have said before that the Integrity Commission or the Integrity Committee of the ANC, uh, what it lacks in the main is integrity. Because of the, if you are Jamini, you get treated differently. If you are Murulong, you get treated differently. Similar cases never get treated the same. So there are private deals under the table because they know that if they charge Pasazan and Jamini, the roof will cave in on them. So these are small politicians. They can just eat them for breakfast and then enjoy the day. That's the, so the, there's no equality in the ANC. We're not all equal uh, uh, in the eyes of the ANC, which is why there's impunity to say a president who commits various crimes must be protected because he's not Sandy Leswana. Sandy Leswana, they'll send the local van, I'll be thrown in the back of the van immediately. I do something because we are not equal in South Africa. So there is apartheid in South Africa today. It's a counter revolution that is in progress. Now, this was um, uh, Fikile Mbalula, the ANC Secretary General's. Uh, uh, a comment um, the other day, Dr. Ndo, um, uh, to when he was asked about that leaked uh, uh, Tabombegi letter. Take a listen and then I'd like to hear your response um, to what he said there and where he left uh, the matter. The ANC finds it regrettable that the letter from former President Tabombegi directed that national officials have landed in the public domain through a leak. The national officials will discuss the letter and seek an audience with former president. Uh, it is only then that the ANC will consider a commentary on the contents of the letter and discussions with former president Mbeki. This is not the first letter. Uh, there are a number of letters the former president have written and the, the modus operandi has been the same. 
We don't intend to, write, to run the organization through letters. Political matters must be ventilated and be engaged upon uh, openly with the leadership. President Mbeki is our veteran, and when he raises views and uh, concerns, we've got to listen, and we also give him our side of the story. Uh, there's no need for anyone to get into an altercation because of something that, uh, for a good purpose, was sent to the national officials, but somehow was leaked on social media and WhatsApp groups. Uh, there will be a temptation from some within our ranks to seek to respond to the contents of the letter. We call upon all our members, leaders, rank and file, to exercise the restraint and allow national officials and the NEC to engage with these contents uh, of the letter. It has always become fashionable in the ANC when something is raised that many or few don't agree with, it becomes a public discourse. The issues that Comrade Mbeki is raising are important for the discourse within society and our own organization. So we will engage with the former president uh, on the matters that he has raised. And uh, once we have uh, uh, finished that engagement, we will make uh, our view very clear in terms of the contents of the letter. What did you make of that response, Dr. Ndau? I think there is um, a lot of anxiety, especially on matters related to uh, Parapara. And the anxiety is informed by the fact that it appears as if those that were supposed to, or those who are supposed to act, are actually taking time. There are a number of institutions that are busy investigating this matter. At the same time, the same anxiety appears to have moved to Parliament because they also want to investigate. But equally, issues that are being raised by former President Zuma appears to be issues that are actually putting the ANC at the corner. The tone of the letter, as I, as, as I read it, talks to the loss of support by the ANC if this matter is not properly handled, and it talks about the perceptions that ordinary citizens might have based on the conduct of the ANC MPs in Parliament. Of course, there is a response by Balula that says that they are going to deal with this matter. But the critical uh, issue with me is how as members of the ANC former leaders and current leaders have to interact with the ANC. Do they do that through writing letters or do they do that through approaching the ANC leadership and have a discussion with them? That is the matter that the ANC still has to clarify. But at the same time, you don't need the ANC that appears to be avoiding accountability and uh, behaving in a manner in which a perception can be created that there could be something that they are hiding, because that could create a situation where ordinary citizens might not be in a position to trust the party. My sense also is that you also do not need, whether the letter is leaked or not, you also do not need to see the ANC that appears to be at, at war with itself in the very same vein in which members of council in Mangaou will vote against their party. Party leaders will always be throwing stones at each other. For me, that does not uh, uh, put the ANC in a very, very good position. A way to manage uh, relations within the party, in my view, has to be established so that there is harmony within the party. Uh, potentially, at least, uh, uh, Mr. Swana, I mean, what could the Tabombegi leader, I mean, letter, um, do 
you know, um, going, going, going forward, depending, of course, on its handling. But what, what potential uh, does it have, um, you know, um, to, to, to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, add fuel to the fire, so to speak, or embolden um, those uh, who may have been, or who have been raising issues um, around the handling of this thing, and uh, especially those, of course, who are opposed to uh, who've been opposed to this to the handling of this matter I'm thinking here of someone like Dr. Zueli Mkize who once said I mean during the interview we had um, with him ahead of the um, ANC's elective conference he was very unhappy with the way um, uh, the leadership or, <laughs> uh, or as he sort of suggested the dominant faction um, handled um, this particular matter, he uh, suggested that people were muzzled and it wasn't handled the way things are normally handled um, within the National Executive Committee of the, of the ANC. So what could the Mbeki letter then do? Could it possibly open um, this matter up for further discussion and who knows what may happen afterwards? The first of all, if you look at the outlook and actual behavior of the two principal bodyguards, political bodyguards of President Sir Ramaphosa, being Gwede uh, Mandashe and Mbalola, uh, so far what they have done around the Palakuna issue is to form a ring of steel to bulldoze the whole situation and to silence every other voice and to insist that this thing must not be discussed, it must just be stalled, uh, stonewalling at every turn. Uh, Mbalula says that uh, Mbegi has written many letters to them. So this is not the first letter. What it does not say, what was the outcome of those letters? After they received the letters, what did they do with them? Uh, I remember, uh, I don't know if it was a letter or not, but Mbegi said, this thing of Palapal is now going to this Section 89 uh, committee panel by uh, a panel of three by uh, Sandy Leno, Judge Sandy Leno. Prepare yourselves for any possible outcome. It could be that the panel says there's no case to answer, but if the, the panel says there's a case to answer, what preparation would you have made? The likes of Matthew Posa came and made Mbegi uh, 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 to appear as if he's a, an intellectual infant, really ridiculed him uh, for saying that, uh, uh, that he has not said anything that is worth anything. So this letter that Mbegi has written, uh, it says on record that he did not keep quiet when the legacy of his father's Lutuli Legacy of being rubbish. He did not keep quiet. He actually put it on record. Mm. So I would then say that those who want to challenge the unfair processes, even this one that happened in Mangao just now, even what happened in Gosazana Jamitsuma, it's a continuation of an unfair pattern inside the ANC where Sir Ramaphosa, like Zuma before him, is being favored. He's being mollycuddled, he's being uh, cocooned and protected from the clear consequences of his irresponsible actions. Mr. Sandler-Swana, Dr. Levi Endo, let me thank both of you for coming on this evening. Really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. After the break, former DA leader Tony Leon on the official opposition's weekend elective congress, as well as its 2024 national election prospects. The DA believes that whoever gets elected at the party's Federal Congress this weekend 
could potentially be the country's next president. That's if the party manages to ask the ANC government in 2024. The DA today briefed members of the media ahead of its two-day elective congress to be held in Midrand, north of Johannesburg. Over 2,000 delegates will deliberate on the party's resolutions, policy proposals, as well as elect leadership. The stage is set for the Democratic Alliance's Federal Congress this weekend. The party has labelled it as a game changer as it prepares for the 2024 general elections. It has set its sights on the highest office in the land. So that's why I say this Congress is important because the leader that is elected is very likely to be the presidential candidate and with the ruling party set to plummet by such a large percentage, there's a lot that can happen. The party's online voting system will be used by delegates to cast their ballots for their preferred candidates. Federal leader contender Dr. Mpo Palazzi has raised concerns in a video to delegates about the credibility and secrecy of the election system. So we use OpaVote and we have been using OpaVote for the last three or four years. We've used it in previous federal congresses. We've used it as recently as in the Eastern Cape um, at a provincial congress. It's been used in other congresses. And indeed, it's been used in various caucuses around the country to conduct elections, including the city of Johannesburg. So we believe it's a proven system within the DA. It's been used for a number of years, as I said. In all those years, we have never once had a query or dispute about the integrity of the system and the secrecy of the ballot. The party says it will also use its Congress as an opportunity to self-introspect, especially on the issue of coalitions. Recently, the party lost the Johannesburg and Ekurleni metros. Delegates will further deliberate on the resolutions and amendments to its constitution. Natasha Pir, SABC News, Johannesburg. But just how strong and united is the DA going into this Congress? Who's most likely to emerge as the leader come Sunday? And can that person realistically steer the party to any form of victory in the 2024 national election? Now, Tony Leon is not only the official opposition's former leader. From time to time, he gets roped in, formally and informally, to help deal with some of the DA's internal challenges. Early this morning, I caught up with him. We leave you with that interview. From the Watchdog team, have a good night. Tony Leon, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thanks very much for having me, Boyo. Well, 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 the party you dedicated such a significant portion um, of your life too uh, is, go is going to into an elective congress um, this weekend. Are they in the best of shapes as far as we can see? Well I always think uh, what President Clinton uh, said is so true compared to what and I guess compared to the position it was after the 2019 election the DA is in better shape today than it was then it's had some wins, it's had some losses just this week. It won back the mayoralty of Pretoria, Chwani. It lost uh, 24, 48 hours later the mayoralty of Ikuruleni. One could argue that those, uh, particularly Joe Big and Ikuruleni, were never likely DA uh, victories to install a mayoral committee, but they had them for a while, so that's a loss. So I think it's a mixed bag, but I think the party is more stable and more forward-looking and less introspecting than it has been in the recent past. So probably on balance, you would say they're in a consolidated position, but of course they, they need to put their best foot forward in the run-up to next year's general election. Well, what makes you say that, though? What can you point to as evidence of that? Well, I think the there seems to be a more unified approach by the party and its leadership. There's not a lot of uh, leaking of different agendas by people. To the extent there is a contestation, there's going to be one this weekend. It's pretty much out in the open. Um, and I, I think the party representatives, just as I uh, encounter them, seem to be uh, less traumatized than they were <clears throat> after the 2019 election. Once again, it's compared to a low point. 
whether they're going to be able to maximize the country conditions to their political advantage at the polls next year, well, that's a different uh, order of questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, if, if then, I mean, in, 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 in your view, it's um, going into this uh, a Congress, um, having consolidated somewhat um, and uh, unified, mm -hmm. does it matter then who will emerge as the leader? Well, you know, I, I would think that it's very probable, just on my readings and uh, what you've read, that the current leader and leadership will be re-elected. I, I think part of the reason for that is that nobody wants to really upset the apple cart just on the eve of what can be a very consequential election by installing a new leader, quite aside from the merits or the demerits of the candidates. So I, I do expect the current leadership to be re-elected. But of course, I'm much more interested in what's going to be said on Sunday when the leader, whether it's the current leader or his successor, um, says rather than on Saturday when they go through the ritual of voting their leadership. Because I think that the leader, the DA, likely to be John Steenhazen, has got to set out a compelling vision of what he and the party, or she and the party, if he loses, is going to do, not just to make an off to the country, but to try and make sense of what has been a very fragmented opposition landscape, something I've been banging on about recently, Voyo, because, you know, the leader, the DA, uh, or has been this position ever since I was the leader a long time ago, has got two responsibilities. The one responsibility is leader's party, but the other is, under the Constitution, the leader of the largest minority party is the leader of the official opposition. But obviously, there are other opposition parties in that space. And so I think it does fall on the leader, the DA, to help give a lead to the opposition cause in South Africa so that that opposition can become an alternative, not just another opposition force if you get my distinction there well i mean if uh, the experience of coalitions um is anything to go by the da is not doing well um on uh, that score because uh many if not most um of uh, their allies are dissatisfied uh, with the way the DA has managed these coalitions, that uh, it is a bully, that it doesn't listen to anybody, it behaves as though it has won elections, when in fact um, the emphasis should be on co-governing and consolidating um, the opposition. And the, the coalition arrangements would have given a perfect start, I mean, to whatever may come, come, you know, 2024 and, and beyond. But their view is that um, the DA ha has handled these coalitions dismally. Well, I think there's a, a mixed view there, and there's certainly a mixed bag you can point to. I, I do think the fact that the coalition managed to reassert itself in Shwani this week is an indication that although there's been some uh, collateral <laughs> and, and, damage in the coalition building... And lost the Gurulene yesterday. They did. Although, I have to say, in both... Well, Pretoria, Chwani is a different case. In both Joburg and Ukuruleni, I mean, the DA was basically put into the mayoral positions by the EFF voting alongside them unwillingly or, or, or unexpectedly. So it was always going to be a stretch because, I mean, in Joburg, the DA only got, I think, what, about 26% of the vote in the uh, local government elections. And it's very difficult to launch a mayoralty or leadership position from such a, a very fragile base. But I think the premise of your question is correct. I think there have been some bad experiences in there. And of course, you know, here's the thing, and, and this I think is a curtain raiser for what's gonna happen next year. There is an inherent paradox, if you like, between having a coalition government among opposition parties and each of those opposition parties trying to maximize their support vis-a-vis -vis the other opposition parties. So I think, you know, with mixed evidence, as you might suggest, I think the DA leader on Sunday has got to turn the page on this and say, I'm going to make an open, generous offer to all other opposition parties outside the EFF as to what we can do 
to prove to South Africans that we are uh, going ahead as a united opposition force, given all the contradictions in the situation and given the limitations of our system. I mean, without, you know, turning this into a debating point, Voyo, I think you could point to the ANC as a, a coalition organization itself and, and how badly managed it has been just in terms of its internal coalition arrangements with the all kinds of factions. I mean, the bigger political parties get, the more space they occupy, the more those tensions emerge. I think wise leadership is a leadership which can acknowledge that situation and try and make an offer to voters outside of the uh, all the messiness of internal political arrangements. I used to say, and I was very imperfect at this, so let me put my hand up and take responsibility when I was in charge was a long time ago, that political parties mm -hmm. that look inside tend to lose. Political parties that look outside tend to win. In other words, if you actually go and put your offer to the voters alongside your allies, instead of just fixating on the internal arrangements in your party or your coalitions, you tend to do much better. And that, I think, advice remains true today, despite the difficulties of the political weather. And even then, you'd have to say that I don't think that the record of governance of uh, the DA is anything but where it does govern far superior to what the ANC has put before the public. Do you think, I mean, outside of uh, parties like your FF pluses, uh, do you think it matters to whoever may, um, you know, potentially become a, an ally of the DA that uh, the DA hasn't shaken off um, the reputation um, <coughs> of, uh, of being um, anti-black? Yeah, look, I, <coughs> that is a, a, a very uh, basic canard that's been rained down on the party, uh, well, ever since it was formed in the year 2000. It is completely without substance in terms of how the DA uh, treats all people in this country equally as fellow citizens, its commitment to the Constitution, which actually the DA helped to write, or the DP did, I can say that because I was there at the time, and for which we voted. And progressively, the party has uh, expanded its offer to more and more people. It has a multiracial caucus in Parliament, in the cities. But, of course, a lot of artillery has been fired on the party from the ANC and from a lot of people in the media saying, you're a white party. So that is a perception. I think it is belied by the realities, but let's just deal with the perception. On the other hand, for, I don't know, a dozen general and municipal elections since the DA was formed in the year 2000, the party has consistently, against all other opposition competitors, been chosen as the lead opposition party. So if there is going to be any opposition cooperation, you can't do it outside of the DA because the DA is the party that has the lion's share of the opposition vote. But obviously what the DA has got to do, and this I think is a forward-looking thing, is to say, well, okay, we've got a reasonable, significant amount of support, but we haven't got all of the opposition support. And there are a whole lot of voters out there who are disenchanted with the ANC, disenchanted with load shedding, disenchanted with unemployment, disenchanted with a very blighted uh, country picture. What can be done to attract those voters? And maybe the DA in and of itself can't do that, but an imaginative set of opposition cooperative arrangements could excite the potential uh, opposition vote, not just the actual existing opposition vote. And I think concentrating on that, far more on trying to say, no, we aren't, when people say you're an anti-black party, which clearly they aren't, but that's a perception, is going to be far more productive in terms of political effort than trying to get into a yes, a no, we aren't, yes, we are kind of argument mm -hmm. with history, really, and with the traditional critics of the party. Well, critics uh, have said that nothing demonstrates 
um, the fact that uh, the DA lacks that intuitive connection with black people than the ex uh, uh, you know departure of uh, Musi Maimane, who people say was trying um, his dumbest to um, really change the perception, as you call it, of a party being a white party. Yeah, look, uh, I was quite closely involved in a commission after the appointed by Musi Maimane, I have to say, not, I wasn't appointed by anyone else, with two others to look at the party's performance, including the leadership uh, in the run-up to the 2019 election. And, and I have to say that, you know, I think we received 240 written and verbal submissions to that committee uh, or panel. And there was widespread dissatisfaction with the leadership of the party at that time, including the leader, but not confined to the leader. And we reflected that in our report. And uh, Musi, as I recall, was not forced to leave the party. He chose to go in the light of that report. So, you know, we can argue that every time someone leaves who happens to be black, that is a, a knock at the party's credentials. And of course, at one level, that's correct. But I think far more fundamentally, Boyo, you've got to say, does it actually matter to folks on the ground? You know, uh, Helen Zilla and Twitter are old friends, if you like, but she once said something very importantly, where she said Twitter is not a voter's role. So I think a lot of what preoccupies us in the public commentary space might or might not impact on people as they go about their daily lives, which are often miserable and often in conditions of extreme poverty. And I think any party, including the DA party, whatever its perceptions might be, which can make a bold and imaginative offer to people who are feeling, for various reasons, distressed and uh, unsure of the future, has an option to renew faith with its voters. That I would hope to be the case. Otherwise, we can simply reduce our elections to racial census, which rather defeats the purpose of living under a constitutional democracy based on equal rights. I don't know if you saw a report the Mail and Guardian published um, last month, uh, which gives an account of a report that the DA federal executive actually commissioned in 2021, just months after uh, Musi Maimane resigned uh, from the party over its performance in the 2029 um, um, elections. But essentially what um, it suggests is that uh, Musi Maimane paid the price for trying to, you know, bring the party uh, to a point or a level where it resonates with uh, black people in particular. And that, in essence, was his sin and, and nothing else. I'm afraid I haven't seen that report and I don't know to what it refers. So all I know is what report I was involved in compiling. And the simple fact of the matter was in the 2019 election around which there was a proper investigation, the party lost 450,000 votes. The first time actually in 19 years since its formation that the party had gone backwards in election rather than added votes to its total. So that's why I think the party was deeply concerned at its decline. Now, uh, you can argue, well, if, if the party leader at the time had done certain things that he said he set out to do, that would have reflected in votes gained. In fact, the party went backward on every metric among the whites. Well, well he, nev he never got to do it. And that's precisely the point uh, this, this, uh, oh, well, uh, the, the, the article yeah. makes. <laughs> Well, but it seems to me uh, actually an, an exercise entirely in theorizing because uh, he's no longer the leader and uh, he chose to leave the leadership of the party and he set up his own stall. Now we can see, or you'll see in next year's election, exactly you know how much support he is likely to get under a new banner because uh, that might tell us something as well compared to the party that he left. I, I am not sure that all the comings and goings on the opposition landscape do anything other than to simply embolden what is an emerging ANC and EFF cooperative agreement. I think that is the other un underreported fact of our current politics, is that despite the EFF uh, going to the streets very unsuccessfully two Mondays ago 
to bring the nation to a halt in order to oust Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa and the ANC. Simultaneously, you talk about contradictions in life and politics, the ANC in Gauteng is collaborating with the same EFF, which wants Ramaphosa to be removed as president, uh, in order to dethrone DA mayors in Gauteng and install puppet mayors from minority parties controlled by the EFF and the ANC. I think if you know if we're going to look at the internal machinations of parties, that might be an interesting place to go and focus because it suggests to us that in the run-up to the election next year, with the ANC likely to record a historic low, there is every prospect of an ANC-EFF national coalition. And I think it is beholden on opposition forces across the range who, outside of that cozy arrangement between the ANC and the EFF, to cooperate and to show South Africans they have a common cause around creating a set of governing arrangements outside of the ANC and the EFF. And that, to me, rather than fixating on what happened or didn't happen in the 2019 election, is going to be the determination of opposition success or, on the other hand, equally, opposition failure. But isn't it also an underreported fact that uh, the DA is in serious um, trouble than anyone would make us believe, and that contrary to a claim that the party makes in a statement that uh, they released yesterday, that they are a government in waiting, it is in serious trouble. If you take the latest poll by the Social Research Foundation, it, looked, it, it suggests that the ANC may get 45.9%, the DA 23.3%, um, um, percent. And if you look at that on the back of that 2016 to 2021 um, decline of 1.4 million in terms of absolute numbers, then John Stenhazen, if indeed he emerges, um, is in, has, a, has, a, has, a, has, a, has a serious work, some serious work to do. Yeah, look, uh, the, those are poll numbers at the moment, and obviously they're going to fluctuate over time. But I think, once again, we go back to where this conversation started, Boyo. Uh, I think the fact that the DA has got a quarter, more roughly speaking, of the votes of all South Africans who go and vote is not an insignificant achievement. It is certainly better than any other opposition party. It's far from getting towards the 50%, as you indicate. So... One of the articles I wrote recently pointed out the fact that actually since 1994, the opposition outside of the EFF and the ANC, which essentially are two tributaries of the same river, has barely budged from the 34% obtained by the non-ANC opposition parties back in 94. Its composition has changed, you know, from what it was then, and some parties have disappeared altogether, but it actually the, the grand total hasn't changed. And what I'm saying is, if I was the leader of the DA today, which I'm not, and I'm not standing for the position, I would be single-mindedly concentrating on how do I add to that 34%. How do, because if you simply add 6% to it, then the combined opposition's at 40%, and then the ANC and the EFF arrangements are in danger. If you add uh, 10%, then you actually start to look like a governing alternative. And I, I don't have the answer to that. I certainly know the question to ask, and I hope it will be answered by the DA this weekend. What am I going to do to add to that 34% total? It might not be that the DA in and of itself can move beyond, say, 25%, which its own polling suggests would be a good outing for it, and your poll suggests 23%. But the question is, there are others with whom we can cooperate, formed and yet to be formed, who can actually close that gap together with us. And with all the past uh, experiences, limitations, bad chapters and coalition building, all those things, I think that has got to be the single point of inquiry and answer uh, by the DA after the weekend. Tony Leon, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, Roya. Great to chat to you.